Hi again, welcome. Welcome back if you've been here before. I am once again. Gideon, can you not? Well, hello. It's a, uh, it's a me. Hi. <laughs> it's a me again. I don't know why I keep uh, saying it the like it at the. Welcome. Welcome back if you've been here before. I am once again Little Beauty and Hitcher. So this is the part two of a two-part video, obviously. And the first one, uh, I would recommend you watch that one first. I will briefly state again, these topics may kind of tread into trigger warning territory as far as R word, topics, misogyny, trans misogyny, transphobia, the medicalization of intersex people and just general bigotry. Forewarning, we are going to be talking about some more mythology. And as I said in my previous video, mythology as we know it, as what is published, it was interpreted and translated by white Christian men. So this video is obviously the part two. So we're gonna be talking about gender in mythology here. I have a bit of a preamble for this section, so I'm just gonna quickly go over that first. So trans, gender fluid, non-binary, genderqueer, etc., and intersex gods, goddesses, and deities were actually pretty common, like far more common than you would think in a lot of mythology. So along with this general disclaimer, I just wanna highlight again that there may be phrasing or words that come from the historical interpretation that aren't relevant in ways of discussing our modern understandings of it. So this will come into when we discuss things like third gender, spirits, or referencing intersex people. So I just wanna quickly state that I don't agree with the term third gender because I think gender is limitless. There is no number of gender. Uh, the gender spectrum is a spectrum. So I will be using words like third gender and feminine and masculine spirit because that's what is written in the interpretations. But just know that I don't agree with those terms per se, but they help in the context of these myths. Before we even crack into the myths, I have to do a bit of a biology lesson with you all right now. Um, a little bit of a history and biology mixed together. So let's quickly talk about the um, medicalization of sex. Yay, <laughs> fun. Sexual variation. It is something that has existed among fish, reptiles, mammals, and even humans. Unfortunately, the time we discovered sexual variation was in the period known as the Age of Enlightenment. So the Age of Enlightenment gave civilization heaps of nice things like ways to figure out how to not die of common illnesses and to understand the organs inside of our body. And there was a revival of classical philosophy. Obviously philosophy was a huge thing in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And then it kind of, we went into our Chad years in the middle ages and just kind of like books are for nerds. It came back around and our books are cool again and thinking is cool again. Um, so that's the age of enlightenment there. Unfortunately, in the age of enlightenment, because philosophers were like basically giving meaning to everything, we have a theory that was proposed. It's an anthropology theory known as the science of man. It's not so much biology as far as a philosophical interpretation of what a human is, I guess, is the best way to say it. And from the science of man, we had a theory called enlightened fundamentalism. So basically, <laughs> in a very simple way, enlightened fundamentalism was like, I had a hypothesis, I thought about it, I wrote my arguments down, and I have found a way that they are to be true and right and absolute. And so this was one of those things where a philosopher said that there are only men and women, and this is what defines a man, and this is what defines a woman. So prior to that, gender in society has always been observable. Obviously, like the, the difference between the sexes is observable, but uh, it hadn't really been defined on paper until the Age of Enlightenment. So the theory actually came from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a famous philosopher, you may be familiar with him. He wrote to define a clear distinction of the genders in his book Emily. The stuff he said in this book were um, awful, very fundamentalist, and the modern trad wife has a lot to think thank thanks to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He basically defined the patriarchy and thought it was a good thing, actually. Maybe because he was a man, who's to say? If you aren't familiar with the name Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he wrote a theory called the social contract, which was basically the basis of all of 
liberalism. And then flash forward about 50 years after this, and we have a zoologist named Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire. He was a scientist. He was like, hey, so I've been looking at animals and I've noticed that sometimes animals are born with physiological differences. Sometimes they're born with different sex characteristics than what you would expect. So this dude pioneered research into what we now know as mutations and birth defects. He also, unfortunately, was the scientist to discover intersex. Because of his field and his specialty, he classed uh, being born intersex as a mutation slash birth defect. Flash forward about 100 years and this theory has now affected the medical system essentially. So in the 1930s was around the time doctors started uh, introducing medical intervention to intersex children, i.e. mutilating their genitals without their consent. Yeah, that kind of became a part of normal medical treatment for intersex children. So now we are left with what we consider congenital disorders. And I just want to elaborate that congenital just means you were born with it. It doesn't necessarily mean bad. It's a neutral term. Because it is considered a birth defect or a mutation, it's also considered to be comorbid with health issues. But that's not necessarily the case in a lot of instances. Different intersex conditions can affect your hormones, your chromosomes, or the presence of ambiguous genitals. So with mutations, there's this concept of deleterious traits, which just means traits that will eventually kill you. And a lot of people assume that if you were intersex, you had deleterious traits, you would have some sort of health condition that would eventually kill you. That's not true though, because if we look at one of the most common intersex conditions, Kleinfelter's syndrome. Yes, so Kleinfelter's syndrome is a chromosomal difference. A person who has Kleinfelter's syndrome is born with an extra X chromosome. So if you have done high school biology, you'll know that a female is XX and a male is XY. A person with Kleinfelter's syndrome is XXY. So essentially they are both. The problem with that is that when a person who has this condition is born, you don't know because the child looks male by outside observations. They're born with male genitals, you know, pee pee and balls. The thing that is that makes Kleinfelter different to like a, a biological male is that when they hit puberty, they tend to go through a female puberty where they will develop breasts. Fat distribution will be a more typically feminine. They may not develop body hair. Doctors, you know, want to say that Kleinfelter syndrome is dangerous for men, 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 because there is an increased risk of breast cancer. But it's not really an increased risk of breast cancer because it's the same amount of risk as someone who was born biologically female. And the fact is, with intersex conditions, you could be intersex and not even know it because it doesn't always present in physical traits. Sometimes it's internal traits. How often do you get your chromosomes tested? It's way more common than what you would think. It's like really, really common as far as like frequency. It's as common as being born with red hair. So back to what I was saying was that gender absolutionism basically meant that hormonal or chromosomal or physical differences that deviated from the norm were defined as a disorder, an intersex disorder, and thus as a society we viewed it as wrong or not normal, which is not even close to being true. Another thing I want to acknowledge before I even crack into the myths is the fact of gender imbalance in society and patriarchy and all that kind of bullshit. I obviously stated before that it has existed longer than the current western world, you know, like patriarchy is not a new thing and like there wasn't a perfect utopia prior to like the westernization of the world, but yeah, like, like there was patriarchy, there was, you know, misogyny and trans misogyny and bigotry in all times of history. So like, I'm not going to gloss over that and make these ancient societies sound like heaven on earth because they weren't. So I thought the best way to kind of step into the mythology here is to talk about perhaps the most famous intersex god slash goddess, and that is hermaphroditus. And I know the term hermaphrodite has negative connotations with it. As far as stigmatism goes, I don't particularly like the word. But let's get into the myth. Hermaphroditus was the child of Hermes, god of trickery, trade, commerce, and thievery, which seems super contradictory. Like, how can you <laughs> care about commerce and theft at the same time? But 
each to their own, I guess. And Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love, beauty, sex, you know, she's one of the OGs. And Hermaphroditus was named from the combination of Hermes and Aphrodite. Very creative. Why don't people name their kids like that anymore? The myth with Hermaphroditus is a bit weird in regards to how their gender is discussed because it states that they were born into sex but they lived their life as a boy and were treated as a boy for a really long time. They were raised on this mountain and they just kind of like wanted to travel around to other mountains, I guess, and see what's going on in the other mountains. And they went to like this gully and there was this nymph there and the nymph like instantly was like attracted to Hermaphroditus because the son of Aphrodite is probably really hot. Hermaphroditus turned the nymph down and was like fuck off I'm bathing or whatever and the nymph ended up like praying to a god it doesn't say which one to like make them one which is a totally normal reaction to getting rejected this then led to hermaphroditus being fused with this nymph imbuing him with feminine spirit and making him or her or them neither male nor female but also a person with both feminine and masculine spirit so i did mention the spirit thing but that that's going to come up a lot funny enough hermaphroditus eventually becomes one of the erites which is the gods of love they're like a crew so the most famous is Eros, which in Roman mythology is Cupid. Obviously he represented romantic desire. There was also Anteros, who was the god birthed from Poseidon and Nereides mutual love, obviously representing mutual love. Himeros, who represented uncontrollable desire, probably should be locked away to be honest. Hydelagos, who represented sweet talk and flirting. Hymenios, Hy who you may notice the word hymen because she represents brides and wedding traditions, which is so normal. And finally, Pothos, like the plant, who represented a romantic longing for a lover who was far away and absent, which is funny because the plant was named after Pothos because it, it's a vining plant and you know. Just a little bit of botany. Hermaphroditus joined the Eretes and became to represent, in heteronormative interpretations, the lifelong union between two people. Certain people say that it's not as definitive as man and woman. It could both represent the duality of a person being both masculine and feminine in a romantic way, or like the unity between tops and bottoms. In Japanese mythology, they have what is not necessarily a god or a goddess but they are like spirits called kami a famous one is inari okami who was a shape-shifting being who often took the form of a white fox or kitsune so yeah inari okami was like a quite like renowned worshipped deity in japan like the red temple gates um actually are theirs they're like mythology doesn't really focus much on their gender but what does stick out to me is that they often take the form of male female they also take the form of ambiguous genders or androgynous genders so like people describe them as like gender fluid because they don't really stick to one gender presentation when they take human form people often refer to them in gender neutral language as well a famous greek myth that involves transition is the story of iphis so this isn't really about a god or a goddess it is just a tale from greek myth it's also really interesting because this tale features egyptian mythology so for historical context trade routes from egypt to greece and onwards and further you know you've heard of the silk road right like a person on a trade route from egypt to greece would stop in greece and pray at a temple of one of their gods and you know that was a pretty common thing also cleopatra was greek so the greek and egyptian relations were strong perhaps yeah so let's break let's go back to the story of iphis so iphis was the child of a poor couple named Lydgus and Telethusa. So Telethusa was pregnant and Lydgus really wanted a boy because at this point in history, dowries were still a thing and they were quite poor. So if they had a daughter, they wouldn't be able to afford a dowry. A dowry is basically a large lump sum of money that you give to the parents of the groom when your children get married. Lydgus was like, I really want a boy. And if you have a girl, I will unalive that girl. Telethusa was obviously mortified by this concept because like she wasn't particularly thinking that far ahead in the future. She just didn't really care. She just wanted a healthy baby. I think that's 
pretty normal. So like, you know, Telthusa is like really bothered by the concept that her baby might get murdered. And she is visited in the night by Anubis. Bastet and Happy, who are all Egyptian gods uh, and all re- represent kind of like very different things. So it's an odd, odd pairing. And they tell her, mm, sorry, you do in fact have a baby girl in there, but we have a really, really great plan. And if you agree to follow this plan, we promise we will protect you. The great plan was just to raise the child as a boy and just like, that was it. Like the brain power of these like huge ancient gods brilliant. So Telethusa gives birth and somehow manages to conceal that it's a girl and Lydgus falls for it. I like all I can think of when I read this part is like in like 90s movies and TV shows where the baby comes out and the dad sees the umbilical cord and he's like well that's my boy. Look at how huge his wee wee is. But anyways Lydgus decides to name the child after his father naming him Iphis. So the plan that these, you know, Egyptian gods came up with was solid. Iphis was raised as a boy his whole life. The initial plan was to basically raise him until maturity where it would be harder to conceal the fact that he is biologically not a boy. The lighting is different. It's because my camera went dead. So let's just get back into wherever I left off. The initial plan was obviously to raise Iphis until a mature age and then he would have to be smuggled out of the town at some point because because people would start seeing physical traits appearing on his body and he wouldn't have to worry about his dad killing him. I don't know what the statute of limitations of his threat was because he's like older now, but they still were going ahead with that plan, obviously. But unknowing to Telthusa, uh, Lydgus had kind of gone over her head and arranged a marriage for Iphis to a girl called Ianthe. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty obvious at this stage that Lydgus is a horrible, horrible husband and father. He did not discuss this with anybody first and so this was a bit of a surprise for everyone in general. So the myth kind of varies from there. Basically it varies in Ianthi either knew that Iphis was not biologically a boy but she didn't care or she had no idea. But they both fell in love with each other so that's good. So Iphis prayed to Hera. Hera is like a god for women. Hera was primarily uh, worshipped by women so like she she didn't deal with anything much else. He goes and he prays to Hera basically because he wanted to marry Anthe but he didn't really know what the gods would think like whether they would approve of his gender status. It's pretty unclear whether Hera actually did anything so cut forward we're on the wedding day and Telthusa takes Iphis to the temple of Isis and they both pray to Isis and Isis responds by transforming Iphis into a man. Like it doesn't really end in tragedy, like it just kind of that's where the story ends. So they live happily ever after as far as I'm concerned. So the next segment I wanted to discuss was creation myths because in the context of genders and how many genders were made, um, creation myths all tend to have pretty like progressive approach if you ask me. One of my favorites is from Inuit shamanism. You know that classic phrase of it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Well, the Inuits proposed what if it was Adam and Steve. So their creation myth is a story of two of the first human ancestors were two men named Akhalulu Usi and Umantituk. Sorry if again I know my pronunciation is probably horrible and they were a couple. They weren't two straight men, they were two gay guys and you know being the only two human on earth they got bored and and lonely and they wanted to make more humans so they just decided like let's let's give procreation a red hot try. So despite being both men, Umantutuk fell pregnant somehow. Obviously he wasn't uh, biologically equipped to carry a pregnancy to full term and give birth. So the couple cast a spell on Umantutuk which turned his body into a woman's body and thus allowed for her to give birth to other humans. No matter how you look at it, you can either say like in this mythology, the two first humans were either a gay couple or a couple where one of them was a trans woman or they're both. They are both. (laughs) 
I'm going to talk about Sumerian creation myth. Sumerian being one of the regions of ancient Mesopotamia, um, and they had a few regions, and they their um, myths varied depending on where you were. But the Sumerian myth of creation was actually the inspiration for the Book of Genesis in the Old Testament. I'll try and keep it confusing because the myth is a little bit of a long story, so I'm going to try and speed run it. But essentially, Enki was like the god who was like the boss of the other gods. His job was to delegate to the other gods. According to the myth, the gods were stretched quite thin. They had a lot to do and not enough people to do it. And Enki just kind of got fed up and put himself into a depression coma. When eventually his mother woke him up, goddess named Namu, and she woke him up and she was like, hey, if you're so stressed about the situation, what if we create something that we can outsource our labor to? And the best thing about it is that we will design them so that they can look after themselves and we don't really have to interfere at all and so Enki obviously is like sick sounds good I have like heaps of clay laying around and also heaps of blood as some people have and obviously this is going to have relevance down the line just stick with me here so Enki finds his wife Ninma who is also another goddess who presides over birth there's like several goddesses in Sumerian myth who preside over birth but uh, Ninma is one of them and he explains the conversation that he had with his mother and she's like cool and she and uh, Enki's mother go off to start creating stuff now the thing with Ninma that needs to be referenced here is that she's often described as being androgynous or even genderless because she is not able to carry or conceive children and this was what would be categorized as a third gender it's more of an umbrella term so Enki like comes in delegates as he does and he's like okay so I'm thinking I want like a man kind of thinking I want like a woman and I'm thinking like maybe a third thing yeah so the third gender in ancient Mesopotamian society encompassed infertile women and men or people who just presented more androgynous or didn't really confine into like traditional gender roles of that period and they were accepted there wasn't like persecution of these people they were just a part of society and greek mythology actually has a very similar myth with prometheus creating man from clay and it is said that you know he was alone on earth for like a really long time doing this and he got into his experimental phase and he started doing things like giving female spirit to male bodies and male spirit to female bodies and both to bodies that aren't male or female and just mixing up you know traits from certain genders on other genders etc etc like even in greek mythology gender variation was a thing i wanted to touch on something that i found really interesting when doing research for this because as i said a lot of how we understood society if it was colonized it was destroyed and we kind of fill in the gaps from like spoken word or stories but there's just not a lot of evidence to support it there is times where we do have some sort of historical record to understand what society was like pre-colonization. Myth was more than a story in some societies. It did serve a purpose. You know, obviously I discussed in the last video about how morality was often framed around mythology. So I think I would be doing a disservice to not mention how gender played in ancient societies. So I do acknowledge that even though documentation and evidence is scarce, doesn't mean that there weren't expanded philosophies that we just, we aren't fully able to understand, or maybe we don't have enough information on it, or maybe it's like very much just very different to what we know because that's colonized for you everything must be assimilated <laughs> but there were societies who did function without like the formalities of gender binarism and heteronormativity like it's not inherently the natural default state and obviously these regions and places in the world were colonized and their beliefs were you know often shrugged off as like savage or barbaric or they were pagans or they worshipped the devil or something along those lines. So I want to basically talk about uh, pre-colonial Philippines. Anitism was the name of the belief system that belonged to the indigenous people of the Philippines. Among many of the expansive concepts that this religion explored, there was a very strong focus on the concept of spirit everything had spirit a blade of grass had spirit a mountain had spirit a rock had spirit a dog has spirit you have spirit i have spirit everybody has spirit 
Yay. And so with that, it seems really reductive to have a binary with that spirit because like, how can you say a grass is a woman or man? Like it's grass. And that's very much how the society functioned without like rigid gender roles in this society. There were trans women, there were trans men, there were people who fit within a third gender, there were people who were ambiguously gendered, there were androgynous people, and it was it was normal to express yourself in what way you felt was right to your spirit. When the records of the Philippines kind of surfaced, a lot of the documents that the colonizers had written was around the fact that they didn't really observe the concept of biological sex, like that wasn't a thing, like it didn't matter if you were born with a hoo-ha or a pee-pee like that's not important that's just a part of your physical anatomy it's not a part of your soul you get what I mean and gender expression was very diverse it was a matter of again self-discovery and you decided for yourself so it is noted that roles especially for things like shamans were reserved for people who had like a feminine spirit it wasn't intrinsic to their biology it was more about how they expressed themselves and we know this because When the Catholics went to the Philippines, the Spanish Catholics, they took in a bunch of shamans into an investigation, like an inquisition, a Spanish inquisition, ironically enough. They noted that although everyone they took into this inquisition was was looked like a woman when they inspected their physical attributes yeah. they noted that there were women there were men and there were people who weren't biologically fitting into one specific thing so we can only assume that there were intersex people there as well non-binary people that's pretty strong evidence that gender is not an inherent biological natural thing this also serves to recognize that Ancient societies had a strong presence of gender ambiguous people, transgender people, people who decided to change their genders at some point in life. Even like the concept of third gender is more than just an amalgamation of femininity and masculinity mixed together. Like it's considered to be entirely something else. So to wrap this video up, I just want to restate the facts. The LGBTIQ plus people have existed for freaking ever. Like there is historical evidence, there is mythological evidence, there is law and religion, and there are nations who didn't observe binary gender. Like that's a, that's a new thing. Binary gender is the new thing. Gender variation has existed throughout history forever. And I'll wrap this up with, again, some honorable mentions. So let's fire it off in the speed round. So we'll start off with Nana Bukulu, who was a West African supreme being. She was a part of creation myth. She is said to embody something that would be similar to what we understand as two spirit, masculine and feminine spirit in one. Despite being referred to by she, her pronouns, she's seen as the mother of deities. And she is also described as being androgynous. Tonsured Maze God. What a name is another god from ancient Mayan society. They were described to be male but dressed in garments made for women. So there's a toss up between whether this god was trans and had their identity erased by historical interpreters. There were carvings of this god. So we do have physical evidence that they dressed and presented this way. And some interpretations say that they encompassed a third gender. Ishtar was not trans but was said to... So Ishtar was a big Mesopotamian god she's like i love her she's so cool she um protects sex workers she's very sex positive in the mythology but i've put her in here because although she's not trans or gender ambiguous she is said to possess men and fill them with feminine spirit in her myth this often led to permanently changing them and sometimes resulted in their genitalia changing it was kind of unclear whether she did this as a favor or as punishment the thing you should know about ishtar is she she was a fickle woman uh wajwa was an egyptian god he resided over the nile delta he had very similar myth to harpy who i mentioned in my previous video uh being that he was a trans man because he was depicted as having breasts despite being acknowledged as a man often depicted as being pregnant so that's something to think about lan kai 
uh, it was one of the eight immortals. This is a really popular myth and I had no idea. The eight immortals were like this really famous Chinese myth. Lan Kai was often subject of questions by historians because they didn't know whether they were intersex or whether they were a trans woman or whether they were third gender. No one could really decide, but a lot of people acknowledge Lan Kai as a woman. <laughs> I have here literally every Hindu god. Like Hindu is one of these religions where the law is like so queer friendly, which is really odd because obviously India is kind of under a conservative government. They're very shitty towards their queer community, but their religion describes almost every major god having changed their gender expression at some point or being fluid with their gender presentation. So pre-Islamic texts, supposedly there's a concept of multiple genders in Islam, but pre uh, the Quran. An example of this would be Al Zahira, which was an enchanted fountain uh, where you could bathe in it and it would change your gender. Canis was a Greek figure who had a pretty traumatic myth, and I don't want to retell it because it's kind of horrible. He went through some sort of traumatic event and prayed to the gods to make him a man, and they did. Tirarius has kind of a wacky myth around him and it's a little bit longer but it's so interesting. So Tiresias was a prophet in Greece. He had the ability of clairvoyance, you know, like Greek society had these like loud and proud kind of obnoxious obtuse people uh, and he was one of them you know Socrates as well was one of them and so he you know walking along on a stroll thinking he's top shit and uh he comes along two snakes having some intimacy with one another he hits them with a stick to shoo them away because they're in his way Hera saw this and it pissed her off and she decided to punish Tiresias by transforming him into a woman. The thing is, this was meant to be a punishment, but I don't think Tiresias took it as a punishment, which is the part of the myth I love. She became a priestess of Hera following this, because obviously I said before Hera was a god for girls, and now she's a girl. She went and just started a new life as a woman. She became a priestess, she went and got married, she had kids, you know, she lived a life as a woman for like seven years, uh, still a bit too proud, loud and proud, and she goes on her stroll through the hills as she does and comes across yet again two snakes in the middle of an intimate relationship moment. Well, the myth kind of splits off from here. She either hits the snakes again, and Hera's like, fuck you, that like turning you into a woman didn't punish you at all. You didn't learn anything. I'm turning you back into a man, suck it. Or there's like the other myth is that Tiresias learnt her lesson from the last event of the snakes and let them be and let them do their snake sex. She just walked straight on past. I think that's the better <laughs> end of the story, honestly. Lucippus is another Greek figure who had a very, very similar tale to Iphis. Okay, yeah, so Akan myth was the mythology of the people of Ghana, uh, ancient Ghana. They had like these celestial bodies that were like worshipped and they were described as being either third gender or trans. Abrao, the deity of Jupiter, Aku, deity of Mercury, and Abu, deity of the moon, were all described as being gender ambiguous. I couldn't find much about them because just mythology from Africa is like super difficult to get your hands on. And the final one is Haitian voodoo. So, so they had deities known as Iwas. Many of them had descriptions that were like LGBTIQ plus themes amongst them. Notably Gede Nibo, who was like the leader of the spirits of the dead, was always described as being like sexually fluid and gender fluid and cross-dressed and noted that he did a bit of drag. And he was actually the inspiration for uh, Dr. Facilier in uh, The Princess and the Frog. But I guess that's a queer coded villain there for you. So this is, you know, just scraping the surface of myth and there's obviously more to be explored. I will say it's not exactly easy to research if you don't know what you're looking for. I don't doubt that there are much, much more 
of these themes in ancient societies, in ancient myth, and in religion, in law, in everywhere. Since the beginning of time, there has always been non-binary people, there's always been bisexual people, there's always been trans people, there's always been gay people, there's always been lesbians, there's always been asexual people, there's always been intersex people, and that's the point I'm trying to make here. So I hope it was informative and not too boring. Um, obviously, this is a very uh, information-heavy video, and so is the previous one, so if you did make it to this point, I really appreciate it. I just really wanted to get it out there. I just really wanted to publish this script at some point and I know it's not exactly like a fun video per se. Thank you for watching. I genuinely sincerely appreciate it but if you could subscribe if you like this or comment or share it with someone I would be really really appreciative and I hope you come back and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you and bye.